Uh, I'll, if I if there's something I'm not clear on, I'll let you know. Okay, cool. But basically, I'll hold, I'll hold off on any questions until after the end of the talk is finished. Yeah, I don't think that's a written rule, but it's a, it's usually the case. Um, so you'll have plenty of time. Mark, já pode começar. Okay. You have, obrigado. Então, estamos aqui, bem-vindo a todos, estamos aqui para fazer a, a qualificação do David Arukipa, que é um estudante meu do doutorado da Cosmo, no CPPF. E os membros da banca, temos um, um membro interno, o Felipe Tavar, da, da Cosmo, do CPPF, e um membro externo, que é o Barry Wardell, da University College Dublin, da Irlanda, e por isso vamos fazer a apresentação e a, a defesa em, em inglês para que o Barry consiga um, participar. So, as I was explaining, we, uh, David will present now for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes, there's no specific time, and afterwards um, Felipe and Barry will have plenty of time to ask questions to David. So, I think we can start uh, with a presentation for David. Um, okay, um, should I? I, th I think so. Is that, have you got any questions, Felipe or, or Barry? No, no, I'm fine. Likewise, fine for me. Okay. So I think you can start. Okay, so I'll start sharing my screen first. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Slides? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me organize this. Um, right. Okay, so first, um, thank you for the opportunity to, to present this uh, qualification. Um, here, uh, together with Mark, I'm working uh, in a PhD project called Self Force and Quantum Communication in Black Hole Space Time. Uh, via green function methods. Um, the outline for the, for the presentation is very simple, just three main sections, a uh, green function section, a quantum communication section, and to conclude the self force, and, and there will be some slides uh, talking about uh, the, the future progress. Um, what is the motivation for this PhD project? So uh, as I started the, the, uh, my PhD, uh, we were we started working with extreme mass ratio in spirals because, well, as we noted, since the detection from LIGO's collaboration uh, of gravitational waves, this uh, this this detection um, gave us a more 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 ways to explore this uh, the space time or yeah the space time and. Another another interesting regime where we can also explore the space is uh, in the extreme mass ratio in spirals. In the LIGO case, uh, we had uh, detection uh, gravitational waves from two stellar two black holes from, uh, with stellar mass, uh, and uh, the extreme mass ratio ratio in spiral is a very different uh, regime that I will explain later. And about the quantum communication, as we explore this uh, extreme mass ratio in spirals, we will see that uh, often we will need to calculate the green function. And the green function is a great connection between these two rarely connected uh, problems like quantum communication and memories. So uh, I will start with the green function uh, in curved space time. Particularly, we will focus on only the Schwarzschild space time. Which, uh, with, well, it is very well known the, the metric of the Schwarzschild space time there, and we are interested in the in the green function for the four D Rechwiller equation, the, uh, which is equation one here. And uh, well, throughout uh, the entire presentation, I will refer to to retarded green function as this green function here as the green function related to this four D Rechwiller equation. How do we solve that equation? Um, we have to consider a method that was developed by Anderson and Weissman in 2005. Uh, they tried, well, they 
in the scalar case, they worked with the with a scalar field. They needed to integrate the uh, they, they needed to calculate the self field associated with the scalar field, and that uh, requires to integrate the retarded green function for the spin zero case for the scalar case along uh, a certain word length, as you can see in the in the figure. So they propose or to to divide uh, the, the the regions or the or the world and in two regions, one region called quasi-local and the other distant past. The quasi-local is, uh, in, in each region, we will have to uh, provide a, a, an expansion for the retarded function. And in order to use this method, we have to have a matching region between these two regions. Otherwise, no matter if we were, if we can calculate the retarded function in the quasi-local and the distant past, if we can't join them, we won't obtain the full retarding wind function. We can't obtain it. So uh, in the quasi-local regions, uh, we start with uh, a very well-known uh, decomposition, the Hadamard form for the retarding wind function, which is given by this equation here. It contains two parts, u uh, uh, by x scalar times the delta of sigma. Sigma is the Sinch world function. And the other term is Vs, another bi-scalar, uh, times two theta, two heaviside functions. Uh, we have to consider that uh, this, uh, this Hadamard form is only valid in a certain region called uh, normal neighborhood. The normal neighborhood is related with, uh, well, the normal neighborhood of X will be uh, a region where uh, X prime points inside of this region will be connected to X uh, by a unique uh, geodesic. And this geodesic also has to, to be inside this uh, normal neighborhood. So uh, to solve the, now, once we start with this Hadamard form, the, the retarded green function in the quasi-local region, we, we only have to calculate this U, which is the complex determinant, a very well-known uh, quantity, and Vs, uh, which satisfies the, the homogeneous uh, regular equation. And often uh, I will refer to this term uh, involving U as the direct part of the rotary wing function. And the VS will be the, the, the term involving VS will be the non direct part of the rotary wing function. In the quasi local region, yeah, the non direct part is simply V. How do we solve now we, these two bi-scalars, U and V? U, uh, as I said, is just uh, simply the public determinant. and a paper from Otto Will and Wardell in, from 2011 provides uh, a, uh, a method, which is a method of trans solving the transport equation for, for this uh, bandwidth determinant. And yeah, mostly you can solve this uh, transport equation uh, numerically. You have to provide the, the geodesics along, uh, you will solve the equation and solve it numerically. And Another another alternative that came up uh, came out recently was um, uh, was was provided by a paper published in 2019 by Casals, Nolan, Otewill, and Wardell. They start with a with an Elmo decomposition of the of the direct part of the ring, of the retarded ring function, where we introduce this GL dir, which are now they, they are called. Uh, as the L modes of the non-direct part of the retarded green function, and they are they also provide an expression for the for that uh, GL there in terms of uh, this other Bamkleff determinant in two dimensions that is given. Well, yeah, the, the two the uh, it's this uh, this Bamkleff determinant is defined by this metric by the yeah by the, by a space by a two D space time uh, with this metric. Here, the way to calculate this Vanguard determinant in two dimensions is again solving a transport equation. It can usually it will be numerically, and the small coordinate expansions that uh, they do in that in the paper that I mentioned. It. Now, for the non-direct part, how do we calculate the non-direct part? Uh, well, as I said, we, we only need to calculate the ds and. Here again, uh, we use an, a small coordinate expansion in this form. 
And uh, we will use uh, a method that previously developed by Cassels, Nolan, Dolan, Ottawa, and Wardell from Did it freeze for you guys also, or only for me? It did for me, yeah. Oh. Me too, yes. Okay, so it's not me. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, I was wondering. Oh, wait. Okay. Um, let me see if I can. Is that it? Uh, I can see the video yeah. moving again now. Yeah, yeah, it's back. Okay, I'm not sure what happened. Can I continue? Yeah, you're back on track. Okay, so uh, now I'm in the distant past region. Where... Sorry, David, you're, you're still not sharing, you're not sharing the screen though. Oh. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, all good. Okay. So as I was saying, uh, in the quasi-local region, we need to calculate the Bangalore determinant and VS to obtain the root of the green function. Now we we're moving to the distant past region and for that, uh, for this region, we propose an L mode decomposition again for the root of the green function, and now we define a new L modes that are well, they will be the the L modes of the root of the green function in the distant past region, and these L modes will satisfy a two D dimensional partial differential equation, which is given by this. Well, it's the last equation here, and it's just the two-dimensional Rich-Wheeler equation. There are two methods that we explored to solve this equation. First, uh, well, we will solve it as it is in the time domain. In order to do that, we have to uh, start with the Hadamard form of, the, of, the, of those modes, GL, uh, which are expressed in terms of this V and U coordinates. They are the null coordinates. And once we apply this Hadamard form, the next, uh, well, that Rechwiller to the Rechwiller equation, um, it's reduced to to, this, to solving this uh, this problem here, which is uh, often re referred as the characteristic initial value problem because uh, the initial conditions here are placed along the null uh, along the light cone. Um, in order to solve that. Uh, that equation for that small GSL, uh, we have to do it numerically. And we follow a, a previous scheme developed by Lowstone Price in 1997 that it starts, with, okay, we, we place the initial data along the, the light cone along the U and V axis, and then we start evolving that data. Um, yeah, we, should, we, we only integrate the, the equation that I mentioned and you can solve it with no problem. But that scheme that Glowstone and Price obtained it, uh, is only to order h, h to the four, h being 2h, the step size of the, of the scheme. But now we will add an additional data uh, to the problem by integrating the equation the, uh, along the, the u and v coordinates again, so that we can obtain the derivatives along the light cone and extend the method to a higher order, which is now h to the six. So with this, we improved a little bit the, not only the scheme, and, but also the, the results. And the second method to, to calculate that, uh, to solve the, that to the regular equation is going to the frequency domain. And uh, so we perform a Fourier decomposition of the L modes here, as you can see here, and then the, Rich Wheeler equation turns out in uh, turns out to be uh, just a partial ODE for this x, uh, x uh, radial function. The way to calculate this uh, to solve this equation is by by proposing two solutions or by, by starting with two solutions x in and x up with proper boundary condition as you can see here. And once you have these two 
solutions, you can construct the rich uh, the, the the green function in for that ODE, which is this G omega L from those uh, in and up solutions. That's the second method that we will also apply um, to to calculate or well, to solve the rich Wheeler equation at the end the full for the rich Wheeler equation. The methods to, to solve this equation here, or to calculate uh, the ODE, uh, the rich Wheeler equation in the frequency domain, uh, we will take some methods already implemented in a public repository called Black Wheel per Perturbation Toolkit, where one can find not only methods to calculate this uh, X in and X up solution, but on also any more interesting uh, elements that are very important in general relativity. Okay, uh, now uh, we move to, to, to one of the application of, <clears throat> of, the Reg, of that Reg Wheeler equation, uh, which is the quantum communication in, near a black hole. So how do we perform a quantum communication near a black hole? Uh, we start with, uh, with two observers that want to communicate between each other. So they use uh, what we call the, uh, an unrooted DeWitt detectors as a communication device. And the channel will be a, a, a massless quantum scalar field phi. So say uh, Alice will be the sender of, of a message uh, and Bob will receive that message. So when Alice wants uh, to transmit a message to Bob, uh, what uh, she will do is to first uh, encode the, the message that she wants to transmit into the initial state of her, of her detector. And then she couples uh, her detector to the field for, uh, for an interval of time. Later on, Bob will have to, uh, to couple his detector to the field as well, so that uh, he can retrieve the information uh, about, uh, about the initial and final state of Alice's detector. And, in that state, uh, Bob will be able to decode the message that Alice sent to him. Um, the detect the owner of the with detectors uh, are simply a two-level uh, system with a, with this Hamiltonian here, um, where you can see that well we have an omega d, which are the energy gap between the two two levels, and how the the detectors interact with with the scalar with the quantum scalar field is given by this Hamiltonian, this interaction Hamiltonian here, which where we have uh, two important parameters, lambda d, which will determine how uh, the strength uh, in the coupling between the detector and the scalar field. The other term here, dn, uh, eta d, I mean, is a switching function that will determine when uh, the detectors will be coupled uh, to the scalar field. So how how do we measure uh, how do we measure how uh, this quantum communication how how efficient it is I, I mean that's uh, that's done by the probability to successfully transmit a a bit of quantum uh, a bit of information via the quantum channel so that probability here is expanded in terms of the, the those two uh, lambdas that are the coupling constant constants uh, between Alice and Bob detectors. And this second term here, um, uh, which involves C2 and D2, that will come from, the, from Bob's detector, from, from, from the final state of, uh, state of Bob's detector, uh, is uh, what we call the signal strength. And it is given by these two integrals, C2 and D2, where we can see that they depend on of course, uh, omega b, the frequency uh, of each detector, omega eight as well, uh, the switching function, eta b and eta a, and most importantly, the, the retarded green function here. Here, we should have the commutator of the, of the quantum scalar field, but in the, leading or, in the leading order of the signal strength, that commutator is simply the, the retarded green function. And that's the connection that we have between this the, the retarded green function that I was talking about with, and the quantum communication. And uh, now, how how do we solve this, uh, or how do we calculate the C two D two C two and D two uh, coefficients? 
uh, we start by uh, the, by again uh, uh, with the Hadamard form of, of the retarded green function that will allow us to uh, decompose those uh, coefficients c2 and d2 into two parts a direct contribution c2d and a non-direct contribution c2 and d the same for d as well and for the direct contribution uh, the expression now for it, it is given by equation seven here that of course it, it will depend on u the one great determinant at the end and yeah you, you should integrate this according to the parameters of the system now in a static scenario where alice and bob are especially fixed near the black hole uh, the non-direct contribution will be given by this other integral and where we are introducing this c uh, this g red nd which is uh, which we will call it the non-direct part of the retarded green function and depending on which region we are working on it will be given by uh, simply as i said v0 times the heavy side function and or the distant past it is simply the full retarded green function in that case and here i have a, a result uh, for the leading order uh, signal strength here uh, in this case uh, alice will be especially fixed at 6m and we move uh, bob along a specific region as you can see here and uh, we have here uh, that first and uh, the leading order signal strength is as we expected uh, as seen when alice and bob are close uh, it the leading order is large and then as they get uh, the distance between them uh, gets larger that uh, signal strength starts to diminish and additionally we have here some additional dips uh, here near the black hole that uh, shouldn't be there if we if this is an area where we will be done in flat space time to understand those uh, dips uh, we here we plot uh, the, the direct contribution and the non-direct contribution separately and we can see that the decay the that behavior uh, in the signal strength that decay in the distance uh, is mostly given by the direct part and in the non-direct part, we have some additional features that at the end will be responsible of those dips uh, in the full signal strength. Here I am marking with, with secondary and tertiary um, regions here. Uh, you can see here that we have a, some kind of peak that is uh, here. This peak uh, will determine from which region the secondary null rays uh, that are null rays that orbit around the black hole will start to contribute to the signal strength so in this specific regions bob will be collecting more null rays because yeah some null rays orbiting the black hole are reaching bob and for the tertiary we have a very similar scenario now not only we have the the null rays that are orbiting the black hole. We also have null rays that goes around the black hole at least one. And now those uh, null rays uh, contribute to the to the signal strength. And since we had a dip in the in the full signal strength, we can see that collecting more null rays uh, in this scenario will will diminish the signal strength. That that's a very interesting result that no one could expect i think one could expect that as more knowledge you collect the signal strength should should be better but in this specific scenario it is not the other scenario uh, that we also st studied is the now alice will start falling into the black hole in a following a radial geodesic from 6m and yeah she will start until she falls into the black hole and here i have the signal strength for different uh, frequencies uh, for the detectors and you can see that again we have a decay in the, in the signal strength as, as expected uh, but in the final in the final part where alice is getting closer to the black hole this signal strength is increasing for some reason 
And the reason will be the non-direct part. To understand that, uh, here I have, again, plotted uh, separately the non-direct contribution and the direct contribution to the signal strength. The dashed lines are the non-direct contributions to the signal strength. And we can see that for small radius, um, the non-direct contribution starts to be dominant over the no, uh, over the direct uh, contribution. So that's why uh, we have an increase in in the total signal strength. This and more results are already published in a paper called Quant "Communication uh, uh, Through Quantum Fields Near a Black Hole." This page was uh, this paper was published uh, in a co in collaboration with Johnson uh, Kemp and Martin and Martinez in in 2020. Sorry, in 2020. Uh, this paper is very long. It has 20, 37 pages. It has a very, very details uh, between how this quantum communication works and this the additional features that I showed, and many and any other and more and more be, uh, and more details. I mean, uh, that's all for the quantum communication part. And now I go to the the cell force, which I think it's the most important part in the in the ph in the phd project so in order to solve the the cell force problem uh, well we will start with a simple case which is a cell force for the particle uh, for a scalar particle in order to do that we have a, a scalar particle with charge q and this scalar particle will uh, will have will generate a scalar field phi given by and this field will will satisfy the, the klein gordon equation here with a source mu. This mu is simply the source for a point particle. And since we are interested in, in the method of green function, we can see that now the retarded green function for the spin zero case will be used to construct this, uh, this field here. We have to integrate that, of course, and uh, this retarded green function uh, with the source. And uh, the uh, there's a an important thing about the source since it is a source for us for a point particle um we have to regularize this source because this source will diverge at at, at uh at the particles word line so at the end we will have uh the the field have will be a sum of a singular part and a regular part these two components should be properly uh, calculated uh, with um with a with physically well well determined i mean once you do that uh, you can now write uh, the the equation of motion for the scalar particle in terms of the regular part of this uh, of this of this field here and the i think that the most important part is here that uh is the tail term or the tail integral as we call it and it is just the integral of the retarding function evaluated along the particle's world line. And of course, I, we have to take the, uh, the gradient of that uh, and you read. Uh, now, as I already explained how, how we can calculate the retarding function here, I'm just giving some parameters that we use to calculate the scalar uh, green function now in the in the distant past, of course, we used the characteristic initial data with this uh, with the, with these parameters here. And uh, additionally, as we were working in here, uh, another group um, also war was uh, working with, with this characteristic initial data scheme. They provided a, another scheme that solves the same problem that we were solving, but they have a different approach uh, on how they evolve the data. Uh, for the quasi-local, as I said, uh, we will use in this in the scalar case, uh, we will use uh, the transport equations uh, to calculate the corresponding bump like determinants and then construct um, the non-direct and the direct parts of the retarded green function. The result, uh, well, I have a, here a very quick result for the for the reg, uh, for the retarded green function. In, in the spin zero case now. The blue is the retarded function in the distant past. 
calculated via CID, characteristic initial data. The red is uh, the non-direct part. And V0 is just the, yeah, it's the, uh, it's the non-direct part that appears in the, in the quasi-local region. So we can see that uh, between V and, and in the full rotary green function in blue, there is an overlap region that, as we said, we have to have that overlap region in order to construct the full rotary green function. And you can see that uh, the characteristic in the data does not work properly for early times. So that's why we need to do this uh, matching process. And the other um, approach that we can do is that we have the, the L modes of this rotary green function and we can subtract and, uh, the, uh, the L modes of the direct part uh, of the rotary green function. That result is the, is the red dashed curve here. But we can see that there is still, a, well, the result improved a lot, but near delta t equals zero, uh, we still have a problem here. And that's because our method, our numerical method to, to solve um, or to calculate those direct, those uh, direct modes uh, were not pro working properly at smaller t. That's, that's all the result that we have for the scalar case. And now uh, for, the, for the gravitational case, we have additional things to, to, to follow because uh, the green function uh, in the scalar case was simply the green function of the, of the Regular equation. Um, and now the green function that we need for, to calculate uh, the motion of a particle moving of a massive particle moving around uh, the Schwarzschild black hole. Uh, it's very different. And we start by uh, decomposing the full uh, metric G mu nu here into a perturbed, uh, perturbed metric H mu nu, which, is, uh, which will be the gravitational field produced by the, by the small object and the background space time G mu nu, which is, the Schwarzschild the space time. So we have, a, yeah, H mu nu will satisfy a, 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 a equation 10, but uh, well, we have to perform a, a transformation. We have to take the, uh, the trace reverse metric. Here we have G mu, uh, gamma mu nu, and gamma mu nu satisfies equation 10 here. And once we calculate gamma mu nu, we can calculate uh, H mu nu. And this, this mu nu is calculated in a, in a certain gauge, which is the Lorentz gauge condition. Uh, similar to the scalar case, uh, H mu nu has to be regularized properly. So we, we will have to remove the singular part of this H mu nu and then only work with the regular part of H mu nu. Again, there is a, a formal way and a physical, there are physical reasons how to obtain and how to regularize this H menu. But here I'm just, okay, I'm, I'm just assuming we, we are able to do that. And uh, there are many uh, papers that are, that show how we, we have to calculate or we have to obtain this regular part. In here, I'm just writing now the equation of motion for the smaller object in terms of uh, the regular part of the rotor degree of this H mu nu. And different for the scalar case, as you can see here, the tail integral for the gravitational case, uh, we have a green function that does now it's this G red uh, mu nu mu prime nu prime. This G red will satisfy uh, this equation here, equation 11, which is the equation for gamma mu nu. And okay, so we need to calculate this rotary green function. And the way to, we do that is again, um, we have to take advantage of that uh, we calculated the green function for the, for the Rich Wheeler equation, right? So by following the Newman Penrose formalism, we can first uh, decompose and, or reduce this, the, com the, complex, the complex in this equation. And instead of solving 
calculating this tensorial object, we will calculate uh, scalar objects that are just the projections of the of the bio tensor. And from those psi zero and psi four, which are the vial scalar, we can reconstruct the metric perturbation, or even we can reconstruct the retardation function for that metric perturbation. And those psi zero and psi four satisfies the so-called Tukolsky equation. And thanks to Chandra Sekar, we we have that the relation that we want we are looking for. There is a transformation uh, derived, derived by Chandrasekhar that relates those vial scalar psi, four, psi zero and psi four with the retard degree function of the Rech Wheeler equation. So we can now use the results that we have before and reconstruct the retard degree function, but for the metric perturbation. And so for the spin two case now, um, uh, we're still taking the same approach that we had in for the scalar case. We have a quasi local and a distant pass region. There are some differences between them, like for example, V0 at coincidence is zero in the scalar case, but V2 it's at coincidence, it's not zero. It's this, it's given by this term here. And in order to, to solve the problem that we had at uh, delta T small, now we are using the results uh, from Casals, Nolan, and Otto Wilberg, this paper published in 2019, to calculate this uh, GLD, the, the L modes of the non of the direct part of the retarded green function. So when we want to calculate the self force in the in this case, uh, the problem is that the L modes uh, L the, the first. Uh, L modes zero and one cannot be calculated from uh, from the Rech Wheeler equation, so we have to do it this uh, in a different way. Um, here, I have a result uh, for the for the retarded green function for the spin two uh, obtained first uh, via the CID, as I mentioned. It the black is the is the is the full retarded green function. D two uh, is given well, it's the red line here like uh well here you can see that well all of all the v2 will will match in, in this region with with g red as we were expecting and now we have the non-direct part of this uh, retarding function for spin two calculated with uh, different methods first uh, we used a coordinate expansion uh, for the bank like determinant in two dimension, that's that result is the blue curve, and the other is using transport equation for the same bank like determinant, and the result is the um, the gray dashed. And similar to the scalar case, uh, when we solve uh, when we when we use the transport equation, uh, the method that we had struggles near delta t equals zero, so that's why we moved to to a coordinate expansion for the Vanguard determinant in two dimensions. And the result approaches better to V2 as we were looking for. Um, but yet we still have, uh, for some reason, this v, this non-direct part, part goes to zero, not to the value of V2 here. And that's because, uh, as I said before, the, the non-direct part in that region is V2 times two heavy side functions. So, Though those heavy side, heavy side functions are responsible of this, but we presume that um, that those uh, heavy side functions are, are responsible of this uh, of this zero here at coincidence. Uh, we didn't show it properly, but it is very likely that those heavy side functions are the reason for this. Uh, here, uh, I'm just plotting the full retardation function spin two case, uh, but without. Uh, including the first two L modes, L0 and L1. And you can see here, we still have, a, well, the blue dashed curve here is B2, and where we also uh, subtracted the first two L modes. And we can see that uh, there is a still an overlap between these two. So a method of matched expansion in this scenario is still possible. Now, uh, in order to reconstruct the, the metric perturbation 
we're not looking for we're, we're not looking at the full retarded green function we're looking at the l modes of that retarded green function and here i am plotting the different l modes associated with this uh, retarded green function for the spin 2 case the, the direct um, the direct l modes uh, it is the um, the blue one the full uh, l modes that is the orange one and then when you subtract those two, it that's the the L modes of the non-direct um, part of the green function. So uh, once we have the, uh, those L modes that I showed here uh, are of course are calculated in the frequency domain, and unfortunately, when we want to construct the metric perturbation, we will need the frequency. Uh, the Fourier modes of these uh, L modes. So, for in order to do that, we have to solve the radial equation of um, of the Tekolsky, the, the radial Tekolsky equation. Uh, this radial Tekolsky equation is given by this expression here. And uh, instead of solving this uh, Tekolsky equation, what we will do is well, we will we will refer to Chandra Sekhar, the operator that uh, he derived it and apply it onto the solutions that we have before, uh, that we have uh, for the uh, Rich Wheeler equation that uh, were x in and x up. That was for the for the Rich Wheeler equation in the frequency domain. So we apply the Chandra Sekhar operator onto this uh, the solutions to define. These are in and are up solutions, which are solution homogeneous solutions to this uh, Tekolsky equation. And from those uh, solutions, we can also obtain the Fourier modes of the of the green function for that Tekolsky equation in a similar way as in the Rich Wheeler case. We have to multiply and divide it by the Bronsky of those solutions. Uh, here I have I'm plotting the the L2 case of this uh, Fourier mode. Uh, the blue line is the, the result that we obtained using this expression here. And the red dots uh, are results obtained using the black hole perturbation toolkit. There are methods to calculate this. Uh, these are, are in and are up solutions uh, in the black hole perturbation toolkit. So we compare in here and, and we have we found a very good agreement up to 12 digits. And so uh, now here, I'm going to the last part. Now, we, I showed only the plots for the L2 case, but now I finished calculating the all modes from, from two to a hundred. So, uh, well, uh, and um, once we, we calculated this, this frequency modes, I mean, this Fourier modes, uh, the next step that we are now currently working on uh, is to construct the gravitational green function. And in order to do that, we're following a, a previous work from Nakano and Saki where they have a, a really good prescription how to construct that gravitational green function, that G mu nu mu prime nu prime from this uh, Fourier modes. And we still have to, uh, yeah, this is our future progress as well, uh, future yeah, progress as well. Uh, to calculate the contribution from the low modes L0 and L1. And yeah, we still have to pr regularize properly this Fourier mode. So we, we didn't uh, get to that point yet, but uh, I think we will do it in the next months. And as a final object objective, we will have to calculate the self force or the gravitational self force in this case. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, by the way, I forgot to thank the, the members of the examining committee for, for being here. So, muito obrigado, Felipe, por aceitar o, o convite para participar da banca. And thanks a lot, Barry, for accepting to be an examiner for the, for the qualification of David. So, like I was saying before, now there's going to be the, the question time by the, by the examining committee. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not participating, so I'm not going to be answering any of those questions. I'll let David fend for for himself. 
Um, so it's customary to start with the farthest um, member of the examining committee. In this case, it's it's Barry. So Barry, you can you can start uh, your questions whenever whenever you wish. Thanks very much, David, for the nice talk and everything. Um, so should I ask questions about just the talk now, or is it uh, are we also covering questions on the written part of the? Yeah, I think I think it's up to you. You can ask about both. Okay, I've got I've got a few questions on each, so I can I guess I'll start with some on the the talk, uh, although they're they're closely related anyway. Um, maybe we'll start at the, the end here. You're you're talking about constructing the gravitational green function. Is this um, aiming to do this in the Lorentz gauge? Is it or um, it's it? well, it uh, Nakano Saki constructed this uh, rotary green function in the. In the ingoing radiation gauge, uh, it's um, it's not the Lorentz gauge, but uh, I think uh, we're we're checking if uh, this uh, green function in the the ingoing radiation gauge uh, will will be useful to calculate this self force. But if it is it is not, I think we have to in a, well we have to find a way to 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 go from this ingoing radiation gauge to the Lorentz gauge. Okay, and I guess related to that, the, the regularization process. Then, in the if you were to work in this ingoing radiation gauge, do you do you know how that might work? Um, um, we had ideas how to regularize this, uh, like uh, for example, Nakano and Sasaki regularized this. Uh, and well, tr the process that they follow is to remove the um, like. Uh, let me go back to one of the slides here. I think. Here, equation nine. For the scalar case, for example, here uh, we have the, the L modes of the full rotary green function and the L modes of the non direct um, part, right? So, this is well, this equation is valid in the time, uh, in the time domain, but uh, Nakano and Sasaki they do this in the frequency domain, they are calculating this. Um, and the L modes in the frequency domain is not is not a problem. We already do did that, but calculating this is a different. Uh, I think it's. Well, I don't think someone did that uh, yet. But uh, since Nakano and Saki use uh, a post Newtonian approach, uh, they are able to calculate this in the frequency domain. But yeah, those results are not well. Uh, they are done. To a certain approximation in the, in in, the, in a post Newtonian um, approach. Mm, that was, uh, I think, our first attempt to um, regularize this this retarded green from this retarded uh, Fourier modes that this Fourier modes that we have here. But uh, since we were not able to calculate those frequency modes, um, Fourier modes uh, for the direct part, uh, now uh, we're kind of Looking of looking at different, I'm not sure. Uh, we still have to think about that. I think the idea was to follow okay. Nakano and Sasaki, but uh, it didn't work. It worked. Okay, so you think maybe an alternative approach might be sorry might be better. So you think maybe an alternative approach to what Nakano exactly. and Sasaki were proposing might be better. Exactly. We and were, do you have any ideas about what that what the best approach might be? So we were trying as well, like using a, a matching process as Anderson and Weisman did. Uh, like, like for example, we can calculate V two in the time domain as well. And I think there's a paper from Casals, Nola, Notewell, and Wardell, where they calculate yeah, the same. The, the paper that calculates V2 as with a small coordinate expansion, there are some insights about uh, what the Fourier modes of those B could be, but we still didn't look at in detail. That was another alternative that we were looking for. But yeah, for now, uh, we're more interested in first constructing this gravitational ring function with, even though it, it is not regularized and to see if it is working properly. And 
and that would be a green function for the Tchaikovsky equation. Um, right. For the, okay. I mean, I, I, I have plenty more questions. Uh, shall I keep going or does- Yeah, 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 you've got, there's, 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 you know, plenty of time. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, what about the, the L equals zero and one modes? Have you, um, you mentioned them here that they'll need to be done a different way. Do you have um, any ideas about how you might achieve that? Those mods are, are not difficult to calculate. They are, I think uh, there's a paper from Poisson and Martel where they already calculate those L modes. And I don't remember exactly in which gauge, but uh, uh, I think it was in the red ruler gauge, but it shouldn't be that complicated, I think. I'm, uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but if I'm not wrong, uh, those solutions are straightforward those modes i okay, mean so you're not you're you're less concerned about that than about the um yeah well i'm assuming that modes. yeah uh, i remember that like the, the paper from poisson and Marte, for example uh, they calculated they found it uh, analytically i think so i was assuming that it should we can maybe we can solve it for the spin two case for example uh, we can solve it properly or analytically as well, but yeah. And, and how, how, would, how would you do the um, the direct part, you know, subtraction or relation or have you? Um, for the yeah, L zero and one, do you mean? Yeah. Oh. Um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, about that part. Have you any ideas? <laughs> well, we didn't fine. think of that yet. I think, yeah. Sure. I think that's a, it's probably more difficult than, I mean, these things are always more difficult than you expect. Oh, maybe. Um, but, uh, curious. Yeah, so you're, you're um, just so I understand, you're also, you're, you're, are you now, you've done this two different ways. You've done kind of the, the frequency domain approach on the time domain approach, have you got a, a feeling for which is better? Which is, um, um, I'm, I'm not sure I, uh, I didn't plot the, okay. Um, so we, yeah, we compared uh, only the, the first L mode, the L equals two mode uh, constructed using, uh, well, for the Richwooder case constructed using the, if we, well, the, the Fourier modes of the L, of the Richwooder equation, we constructed GL, and then uh, we integrated. If, sorry, sorry. Um, so first, we calculated the L equals two mode for the Richwooder equation uh, using the characteristic initial data. Then we also calculated that mode. Um, Using uh, a frequency domain approach, which is uh, solving in and up solutions and constructed, right? And the agreement that we find that we found is uh, here. Well, yeah, I wrote it here. Is nine digits uh, at the early times delta t smaller than ten m, and as as t increased, and this agree this agreement decreased to I think yeah seven digits at about delta t equals hundred. So I think, uh, well, we know that a frequency domain method will be more accurate at late time. So I think the, the, the decrease in, in the agreement comes from the characteristic initial data, not in the frequency domain approach. And, and so do I read from that then that you think the frequency domain approach is in the longer term, the more useful one that you Use, or uh, the, do you think the characteristic one still has its its place? So the characteristic, the one, well, the modes obtained from characteristic and shelter uh, are well. We can construct the the, the rich uh, ring function for any spin, and uh, but in the time domain, right? So 
we have many applications for that. For example, the quantum communication was one of them. But now in order to construct the metric perturbation, what we need are the frequency modes of those L modes. So the characteristic initial eta returns the L modes, but in the time domain, not in the frequency domain. So if for, for, for calculating for metric the, perturbation- the one, and yeah. Saki methods, is that right? Right, because yeah. And yeah, when you construct the metric perturbation, you have a, the Chanarsky operator that has to be applied to this, these modes and this Chanarsky operator uh, is defined in the frequency domain, not in the time domain. I think I think there was some, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, some recent work by the Princeton group to do time domain metric reconstruction. Um, oh, um, can you see Pretorius and uh, Justin, um, I need to look up his name now. Um, but they they did something. Um, if are you if you're familiar with the Chandrasekhar's textbook, right? I think they did the reconstruction method that he has in there, um, which is certainly quite hard to um, yeah. understand. But um, they, they were doing this. Uh, I think they were doing for the purposes of doing time domain metric reconstruction. So it, it is. It seems like it is possible. Okay, so if, more of a comment rather than a, a question. But um, so uh, if it's quite that's recent, possible, so, um, so if that's possible, I think we can use V two to cut. Uh, the reason that we were not able to, like, um, well, we don't have much idea how to regularize these uh, Fourier modes is because, um, yeah, V two we didn't have the Fourier modes for V two, that by a scalar. Because yeah, that V2, uh, the solution that we have is in the time domain, the method that we use to calculate that V2. And if there is a, and if it is possible to construct the metric perturbation in the time domain, we can use that V2 in near the, the coincidence. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, that should be it. Well, if that, it is possible, right? Yeah, it, it seemed quite complicated process oh. for them. Okay. Possible, I guess. Mm. I have to look at that. I mean, are you are you all? I is is your ambition here to do to stick with short short shield, or are you hoping to move on to doing uh, rotating black hole space time occur? Um, I think uh, I'm running out of time uh, in the in the project, so I'm not sure I can get to more than short shield. Maybe after the the PhD. Of course, I, I would like to, to move to, to CARE if it is possible. Okay. And, and so in that case, what, um, I'm not so familiar with the Nakano and Sasaki paper. What's the, what's the motivation of going from, so do I understand right, you're solving the Reggie Wheeler equation first and then transforming to the Tchaikovsky and then transforming to, and then reconstructing from Tchaikovsky to get the metric perturbation of that? That right? Um, so, uh, oh, I forgot. more leaning towards the, what you had in your your written part of your write up. You had this, uh, right. Um, uh, um, so, not so much maybe what you talked about here, but in the yeah. So the they text. Did. Um, I, I have to remember that, I think. Um, so first, the reason is that uh, in the Red Wheeler, for the Red Wheeler, if we want to, to use the Red Wheeler green function to conserve the metric perturbation, we can't, from them, we can't uh, obtain the contribution from the low modes, L1, L0 and L1. And uh, in the re in the ingoing radiation gauge, which which where we use the green function for the Tukolsky equation, we don't have to worry about that because 
the yeah the rich wheeler the tukowski equation is more than enough for the we don't have to look at l0 and l1 modes in the for when we work with the uh, with the tukowski equation i do not have to add them in any case whether you do the say the Tukowski or the Reggie Wheeler. Um, I should use, well, I, I think it would be better to work directly on Tukowski, but Uh, the thing is, uh, the methods that we use to calculate the, well, the, the method that we can use to calculate uh, these Fourier modes without going th to Reg Wheeler, like, okay, we can, there is a already implemented methods in the toolkit, but those methods, if you want to, yeah, if you want to calculate uh, those solutions for, uh, for different values of omega, uh, they are not very efficient. They are very accurate. You can provide the accuracy that you want and, uh, and obtain it, right? But since we want to integrate this over a very large uh, interval of omega, that even if you have, you can get accurate results, but if it takes uh, more time, it is not very useful, I think. So that's a, one of the other reasons that we, that's why we, we are working with the Reg Wheeler equation, the, the methods that we have for, to calculate the, the, the solutions of the Reg Wheeler equations are also very accurate or accurate enough and also time efficient. So we use that and then it is, and that's why I think it's better to, to work with the Reg Wheeler and then just apply the chance operator on them and then obtain this, this Fourier mods for the Tukowski solution. Yep, thanks. Um, nice. Oh yeah, so uh, can I ask a question about the, the quantum communication parts sure um in, at the end of the day you end up with working with the retarded green function which is suggestive of actually the fact that although you've kind of formulated things in terms of a quantum mechanical process that there's maybe a classical version of this or that if effectively this is classical um rather than quantum i mean where does quantum mechanics fundamentally come into um, into this and is it uh, essential or is it kind of just a, um, I mean, could, could you have a classical scalar field, for example, and have the same uh, results? So uh, here, yeah, um, I'm not very, very familiar with how this, um, we discussed that with the group, with Johnson, that uh, Johnson, Kemp, and Martin Martinez. They are more, well, they are the experts in that region. And yeah, so the result, this C2 and D2, as, as they, they claim is that uh, you have to have a, a quantum field in order to, to have this quantum communication or this signal strength given by this equation, even though the, the the scale the commuter commutator commutator of the field turns out to be simply the retarding function. If you don't have a, a quantum system there, um, I think C two and D two won't. Uh, it will be zero. I think I, I don't remember it exactly, but the system has to be so, quantum. So Otherwise, there is no signal strength. Well. The C2 in and the two will be zero. Okay, so uh, it's, it's fundamentally quantum, although there is kind of right. appearance of something classical. So I think, yeah, and 
that uh, that the specific topic it's 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 very it's it's discussed in the in the paper that I mentioned it, and they do point out uh, why this cannot be a what there is no uh, classical version of this. It has to be quantum, and I think it's a coincidence that um, like okay, so you can see here p the that probability of successfully transmits a bit of information. The this um, this second uh, term here, which is uh, the signal order is thing, uh, as as you work, uh, as you evolve the final state, or as you calculate the final state of the of Bob's detector, and then um, expand it in uh, in the interaction in the coupling constants. This order will be classical, or will be will be related only with classical com, classical terms like the, um, the like the retarded green function. But the following orders here will not be classical; will contain quantum terms. Okay, um, so I mean, the, the, I don't know if you know the answer to this. Is is this something that if you had, for example, a you know, people do these black hole analog experiments where they have water draining down bathtubs and things. Is is there any sort of experiment you could at least in principle do, or is it fundamentally? Um, um, I mean, are you familiar with these sorts of experiments that they sort of you know right? I, I am behave um, like black holes but aren't fluids or whatever. So do you have any uh, idea if that's something that analog models uh, will well can simulate some some dynamics in the uh, uh, from from gravitational from re general relativity but like for example a fluid uh, with a with a sink can simulate some properties of or yeah can yeah can simulate uh, like some some properties that could appear in a in a in a space time like the ergosphere, some kind of event horizon, but maybe the the quantum the quantum quantum phenomena. Uh, I'm not sure, but it maybe it could be so, some analog when you work with like Bose Einstein condensates. I think I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly, but uh, yeah, for, for with classical fluids, I don't think you can do that. But with a uh, quantum system like uh, Bose-Einstein condensate, I think there might be more things to, to look at and probably you can find an analog to this, but not sure. Okay, thanks. Um, uh... I, I can keep going, or does anyone else want to ask a question before I take the whole time up? Um, uh, we, what do you think, Felipe? We usually, we usually exhaust him. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll the next one. Yeah, I'll let him finish. I, yeah, I'll yeah, go for it. it. Go for it, Barry. And, <laughs> and I, I'm an outsider, so yes, he's going to ask better questions than me, I'm sure. So <laughs> feel free, Barry. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I've got my questions are somewhat technical, but um, that's, that's the way things are. Um, okay, I've got a, a couple more then. Um, the the whole the when we we go back to the idea of doing Tchaikovsky and doing the Chernovsky reconstruction procedure, um, that is set up for the case where you don't have where you have homogeneous problems. So when you have no source to your equation. Um, um, whereas the green function has a source to it, um, is that something we need to worry about? Or um, I guess towards the end of the, so away from the quantum communication back to kind of, well, you certainly had it in your last slide, but um, here, yeah, I, I mean, uh, yeah, so this one here, the, the third kind of bullet point here. Okay, so you can um, compute the Weyl scalars from the Tchaikovsky equation and then go from there via the CCK Chernovsky method to the metric perturbation. But my understanding from that is that 
Um, I mean, that, that is formulated ignoring any right-hand sides to your equation, so any sources, whereas your equation 11 up here has a, di a distributional source. Do you have any idea how that might interfere with your plan so, to... Right. So, so what we have here, um, this arrow represents many things, not just an operator that you can directly apply to Psi 0 or Psi 4. So you have to first, the way that you construct this uh, Psi 0 and Psi 4 have to be strictly with, uh, as a, with homogeneous equation, homogeneous solutions to the Tukowski solution. Like, um, like we do the, the, in, the, in the Fourier, to calculate the, the, the Fourier modes of the Tukowski equation, right? Where? I think it's here. Um, yeah, here. So although the 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 green function, the uh, the Fourier mode of the green function is given by this, you can see that it is it's a product of two homogeneous solutions, right? So when you want to construct a psi four, uh, you have to use this. Uh, these L modes to, const uh, to integrate it over the source and then obtain the, psi the, the corresponding Psi-4. But when you apply the, uh, for example, the Chandrasky operator, you ha will have to apply it onto these uh, solutions here. These homogeneous solutions are in and are up, not onto the source, because the source is the, the part that you are integrating. And the... Um, And the Chanarski will not uh, be applied to the source. It will be applied to onto the reg, onto the green function, and the green function has to be uh, calculated using uh, two homogeneous solutions. Otherwise, you can't apply the Chanarski operator. Mm -hmm. So, so the idea then, to understand right, is that you would <coughs> you would start from homogeneous solutions to the cost equation, and use the Chanarski operator to, to bring you to homogeneous solutions for the linearized Einstein equation for H. Um, right. And then once you have homogeneous solutions for H, you then would reconstruct, you would then use those to construct in homogeneous solutions? Uh, right. Uh, Nakanasaki has uh, show how you can construct non-homogeneous uh, solutions uh, for H mu nu from this, from the Fourier modes of the Tukowski equation. It's, well, yeah, I have to, uh, well, maybe I can show the paper, I'm not sure. Can I? Um, if I'm, yeah. Let me, yeah. Okay. Um, So I will really share my screen. Okay, can you see Nakanon Sasaki paper? Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, there is this equation 4.4. Here, this is the now the the L modes for H mu nu for a given depending. Well, you can construct it from the reg. This this term here is simply the uh, well. It's the reg will the the L modes of the Tukowski equation. And the other operators are simply the Chernarsky operators. And you can see that this other part here, as I said, is the Chernarsky operator, and it only applies on the on this um, L mode, which is constructed with homogeneous solutions. So you can apply this operator on on these modes, and once you get that, you get this uh, this object here, this green function, 
and you follow on simply this um, follow equation 4.4 and you integrate the source this source will be constructed what uh, you have to construct this source uh, considering the stress energy tensor related with with your source in the the gravitational source i mean right so uh, okay so 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 g here is a homogeneous solution of Tchaikovsky equation uh, you mean and, this g here? Uh, the the left hand one oh, no it's not it's, well uh, the thing is the differential operator applied onto it yeah okay okay so yeah, the, the L mode here is is constructed by multiplying two homogeneous solutions. And these two operators can only be applied on homogeneous oper homogeneous solutions. So you can apply it to as long as this uh, L mode is constructed from homogeneous solution. If it is not, I don't think you can apply these two operators. Um. So my understanding of the reconstruction is that there's also an integration step involved. Uh, that you uh, is that the is that dividing by zero pl squared piece or do you know here in four point four four point three no sorry so um, ignoring green functions for a minute the the reconstruction procedure I'm thinking of is that you first of all um, Integrate the vial scalars four times. Uh, yeah, you integrate them four times to get the Hertz potential, and then you different you apply Chernowski's operator to that. Um, where does that come in here? Is that the that the piece that you're highlighting there? So, yeah, that's come that comes from the, from. This is just a, a a simpler way to rewrite the Chernowski operator. It comes from applying. The, the entire Chernowski operator in in the in both uh, the radial and the angular part. This this four or this these three PLs that appears here. Well, it's in the appendix of this paper. So they're here. Right, well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They they're angular derivatives of some sort. Yeah. Like um. So an explicit yeah, way. So it yeah, it goes down there. Okay. I saw it in. So it's it's here, right? The the Chernowski operator and mm -hmm. this H in at the end will turn out uh, here. Yeah, like it's given by B twelve. So those PL are the coefficients that appear once you apply the angular operator that appears in the Chernowski operator onto the solution. Right, yeah. So uh, maybe I kind of going back to something else again. The this approach of going what what what's the motivation for taking this approach of going via the Tchaikovsky equation as opposed to if you have solutions in from the Reggie Wheeler equation already going directly to reconstruct the metric in the Reggie Wheeler gauge, or um, are you familiar with uh, Bernstein had a thesis where he did this in the Lorentz gauge? Is there a, is it because these guys have shown that it's possible or uh, is there some reason why the other methods might not work? So, um... well, we're here, we're, this is our first at at attempt to calculate or to reconstruct th this uh, retarded green function, and we start. We're following the the prescription that uh, Chernovsky uh, uh, developed, and I, I don't remember the, the the year, but there is a paper from Chernovsky that uh, do all these uh, calculations and shows how you can construct uh, the. The metric perturbation from solutions to the Tchaikovsky equation, and yeah, and, and that we're some somehow we're constrained to the to the 
radiation gaze in that part. Not in, we didn't explore other gauges. The regular gaze, as I said, uh, we're not calculated in them, in it, because uh, the L modes, the first two L modes that has, have to be calculated differently. And uh, I, I don't remember if I, the, the, the Chernowski operators, I don't think I can, well, I have to derive another, I, I, I have to obtain the, the, the equivalent of the Chernowski operator for the Sokolsky solutions, but for the rich winner, I think there are, well, probably, other people already have those. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, maybe one more question. Changing topic slightly again, but um, you showed some of these plots, uh, certainly in the written part, and I think you also had them in your talk of kind of the. Um, uh, the non-direct and direct parts of the communication between uh, these kind of nice three, yeah, these sorts of plots here. Yeah, this one here is exactly what I'm thinking about. Um, so uh, you you said it in the, the written, the write-up that um, uh, when you subtract, split it into these two pieces that the direct part always dominates. Um, but if I look at the bottom plot here, um, well, for start, I, I, these two are rotated by 90 degrees relative to each other. Is that right? Yes, it is. So that, the, the, uh, so that I take the, the point you're pointing at now is actually in the top, the kind of the divergence in the other one. Is that, is that right? Yes, it is. Okay. So, so the bottom one here, what happens? in the bit that hasn't been filled in on the left. It looks like it's starting to diverge there. Um, is that actually going to diverge or will it turn around and go back down again? Um, so what, what I'm trying to say is that it looks like in that region on the left in the bottom plot and on the bottom left in the top plot, things are blowing up kind of at the conjugate point, um, the opposite okay. side of the black hole. Um, is, it, is, is it possible that in that region, but the non-direct part actually is more important than the direct part. So uh, first, uh, here we, ha we have to take uh, carefully this region here for, for the non-direct contribution because um, we know we have a here an acoustic. So we have no risk going uh, from, from both sides of the black hole and they are piling up there. And yeah, uh, the methods that we used to calculate uh, the Vangler determinant to, to construct this, this plot here is not uh, accurate in this region. So we're not sure if this will blow up or not, but uh, it is very likely that it will not. I think we, we showed that uh, mathematically in the paper that it shouldn't blow up here. And regarding the other part, um, so we only calculated the, uh, the, uh, the signal strength in this specific region first, because we have some limitations uh, in, the, in the method of mat matched expansions to, to calculate the non-direct contribution. But yeah, as, as you say, you, it looks like it is, um, it is increasing, but uh, again, I don't think it will blow up. It will diverge. Uh, probably, I think it should go to zero because, as I said, uh, the, uh, the 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 non-direct null risk that goes around um, the black hole, instead of contributing to to the signal strength, they they contribute in a destructive way. Like you can see here, those dips are because there there are in secondary and tertiary null risk contributing to the signal strength, and the total leading 
signal strength, uh, it's diminishing. So now looking at the caustic, for example, you will have two null rays that are going from like, like from the left and from, from the right. And probably they will, once they reach Bob's detector, I think they will, they, they will interact. There will be a, a destructive uh, contribution there. So it is very unlikely that, well, I presume it will not uh, blow up for both the direct and the non-direct. Okay. That's interesting. And so, um, I'm, again, I'm just looking at the, the PDF here. Um, so you've done, you've done two cases. You've done one where the two Alice and Bob were static and one where they were, where Alice was falling into the black hole. Is that right? Yes. Um, yeah, the radio linfoil case. And um, you were suggesting that in the radio linfoil case, that it is possible for the non-direct part to dominate if Alice gets close enough to the black hole. Is that yeah. right? Um, that correct reading of that. We can see from this plot here that. Um, yeah, yeah, this plot here exactly. Yeah. So the non the solid lines here, the red. Yeah, let's take the red. It's the the omega equals one over m case. So as Alice falls into the black hole, the the signal strength diminishes in for the don for the direct part for the direct contribution. I mean, and as Alice uh, for the non-direct, which is the um, now the red dashed curve, instead of increasing. I mean, instead of decreasing, it, it increases. And if there's a specific uh, radius when the non-direct part will start increasing. And uh, we wanted to go further and see if this still keeps, uh, well, it still goes up, but uh, again, the numerical, for numerical issues, uh, we couldn't go beyond, but, uh, I think it will increase here. It, it is increasing, of course, and it is becoming dominant over the non-direct, over the direct contribution. That maybe here, oh, in this case, uh, well, yeah, for the static case, well, it's not a very right comparison, but uh, here we can see that also, uh, imagine that Bob now, well, Alice sits at 6M, right? And Bob is, uh, is is sitting closer and closer to the black hole. And you can see that um, the non-direct contribution increases. Uh, it, yeah, it so doesn't it's possible that you would have also seen it take over in this case if you'd looked really closely. Right, uh, so maybe here. The, yeah. Is the static case fundamentally different from the radial infall or is it just that you looked very close to the horizon right. in the radial infall case? Right, I guess, um, like for example here, I don't think it's very, very significant the well it's very the here there's a small peak I'm not sure if one can see properly well maybe if I zoom yeah so well there are two peaks here right so the first peak mm -hmm. here uh, corres will correspond to uh, the peak that is appearing the, the first peak in the non-direct contribution here related with this part. And the other peak that appears is this other feature that comes now from contribution from the contribution uh, for tertiary null rays. So uh, although the in general the, the direct contribution will always not dominate in most of the regions, uh, this particular region or close to the event horizon, uh, it looks like the, the direct, the non-direct contribution will be more significant that, than, the, than the direct. And that can be shown also from this other scenario where now Alice is falling into the black hole and eventually the non-direct contribution grows until it is larger than the direct. Is there a kind of a physical intuition for why that? that balance tips towards the non-direct as opposed to the direct part um, specific regime? 
So since we 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 solve well, uh, what is it? Yeah, these are the well, these two integrals define the, the signal strength, right? Um, for the static case, we we can work in these integrals and try to try try to reduce it and see if we can interpret or justify some features. But for the radial infrared case, it is very difficult to to see here at least, uh, or to see to find mathematically uh, what what is going on or why the non direct uh, the non direct contribution starts increasing. Yeah, it'd be mm. interesting to see if you could fill in that, that other plot where you were showing it kind of the non direct is taking over what happens at the horizon. Um, yeah. Um, does it continue to grow or does it die off again? Um, what would that tell you? I mean, yeah. in terms of you, yeah. you wouldn't expect any classical process to be able to transmit information from the horizon. Out. Um, At least out since we have uh, infinity. If uh, I, I guess, uh, I think if Alice is, is exactly at the event horizon, of course, classically, you can't transmit information. But if Alice is very close to the horizon, um, the, the redshift is the other thing that we have to consider here. Like, uh, each time, like Alice uh, have, ha each time, well, Alice will couple for different, for different intervals of time when, when she wants to transmit the information. And those intervals, in order to be physically possible for Bob to collect, he, he had, I think she has to reduce the intervals less and less and less. That's the other thing that we have to consider. And when you reduce the interval, uh, you can see here, I think, um, well, for the static case, for example, if you reduce the interval of coupling time, oh, the, the signal strength will, will, will reduce as well. So there are many things that are contributing positively or in a positive way and in a negative way in, at the event horizon. I think it's very difficult to, to, to see what, what is going on there. And the only, the only result that we have is, uh, well, we have to at least infer that is a numerical result that it, it is only possible up to this small radius. And yeah, the only conclusion that we have is until at least up to R equals 2.3, I think. Um, yeah, the, uh, um, up to that specific position for Alice, the non-direct part will be dominant. But beyond that, it's very difficult to conclude any, any scenario or how the signal strength will be. And then the difficulty with going closer to the horizon, is that purely just a numerical accuracy? Uh, right. right. The the characteristic initial data that we have um, in order to construct a radial info for Alice, we have to, to to interpolate that characteristic initial data. That's one issue that we have. And then the other ratio is the that for the non-direct part, um, we have to use. Uh, well, yeah, we have to follow the method of matched expansions to calculate that non-direct contribution. And as I said, in order to obtain the non-direct part, there has to be an overlap between the quasi-local and the distant past solutions. But as you approach the event horizon, um, you, you, you no longer have an overlap between them. So we, can, we couldn't obtain the full non-direct part of the retarded function. So that's the other reason that we couldn't go beyond, uh, further. Okay, so it's more than just the, the pure accuracy of the numerical method you're using. Yes, it's mostly more technical. fundamental. Um, thanks. Uh, just looking through my notes here. Um, I mean, I have, I have a few very technical 
comments on your thesis, but I think probably uh, yeah, you know, um, provide you the PDF of those just um, rather sure. than really splitting hairs on the details of that. Um, so I can so I can send you those afterwards. Um, But let me just see here. Mm. Let me just check some of my notes here. I guess in yeah, one more question maybe. Uh, um, so you've got these interesting cases where your quantum communication can kind of pick up the non-direct pieces, preferentially over direct pieces. Is there? Do you think there's any chance of seeing something in like that in the self-force problem? You know, is there kind of an orbit that you could set up that you would similarly? Um, I'm not sure if there's a, yeah, where the distant past or where the non-direct piece is more important than the direct piece. Um, okay, uh, I think we can go here, like, so the, for the scalar case, the tail integral in, in the equation of motion, we have to integrate the, the, the non, in, te, in we have to integrate the non-direct part of the retarding green function, right? So if we only consider um, the character, well, the non, like if we only take like, the, for example, the result from the characteristic initial data, when we integrate without doing any improvements, we will have this uh, this problem here, which is because of, yeah, how, how the characteristic, how the L mode decomposition tries to um, to construct the singularity um, at the at the at coincidence at delta t equals zero. It is so you can't integrate uh, blue without any, doing any improvements because you are including something that comes from the from the from the, from the singular part of the of the retarding function. So that's why um, we have to, we, ha we need both uh, this non-direct part, the blue, and from the quasi-local region, we take B0, which is uh, yeah, the non-direct part in the, in the, in the quasi-local region, and then do the matching between them, like taking the orange and the blue and join them somewhere in this matching part where they both agree. If we don't do that, um, well, first, uh, you can't integrate just V0 because V0 is only valid within the normal neighborhood. You can do that. So we have to integrate both. And, oh, uh, and of course, we have to integrate it after we match uh, V0 and G red here, the blue curve here. If we don't do that, yeah, we were in, including in the integral something that it's coming from the singular part of the retarded green function that, and it shouldn't be there. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. I think I've asked all the questions I have written down here. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Barry, for the appropriate questions and comments. Um, so now, time for the local professor, Felipe, whenever you wish. Okay. Thank you, Mark. So, 
Congratulations, Avi. It's a very nice work. It's um, very heavy and uh, there's a lot of physics and, and uh, it's a very difficult issue to, to do this programming computation. So it's a very nice work. Uh, I have, uh, I'll, I'll be very brief. I'll have just uh, a few, few questions left. <laughs> so just to make sure if I understood correctly, when you, you talk about the Rigi Wheeler equation, you, you mentioned that there's this toolkit available public, um, so you could use it. And, um, and Barry asked you about this and you mentioned that uh, one of the reasons was to do to efficiency. So for me, it's not clear why you decided to, to, to do the whole thing um, differently. Is there any reason? Or um, so, uh, let's focus first on the on the rich water case. Uh, this toolkit here, the black hole perturbation toolkit, has two, a couple of methods to calculate this x in and x up solution. Yeah, and yeah, one a method a very popular method I would say is the MST method that you can use to calculate this too. This MST method is just a series of the yeah, sum of hypergeometric functions and you can construct from them this x in and x up solutions. Um, in the regular case, you can use that, uh, you can do, use that, that method already implemented and calculate those, uh, but we didn't use it because uh, there, is a, there is a time efficiency problem. Those methods are, are very accurate. You can, are, are analytically, right? It, the coefficients in the in front of the hypergeometric functions are analytical, are, are calculated analytically. And when you when you want to calculate x in, say at a certain value of, of omega, the and you have you have to provide uh, a certain precision for that. And the the as the more precision you ask to the method, the working the internal working precision for the for the implemented method will be larger. And as omega increases, that, um, that internal working precision will be much higher. And for example, we get to the point where when omega was 10, for example, the precision to have uh, this X in and X up solution to, I think it was 24, we needed more than, more than 50, 100, uh, working precision in the method so that was the something that we couldn't but i, I understood with. that i understood that you use this toolkit as a validation for your method also or am i wrong or right wrong right so um, you could so you could you could integrate you how did you do that i did it for this part uh, so you can see here the the red dots are are the results uh, using the, the, the black hole perturbation tool, toolkit, for example. And I didn't do it for, uh, yeah, I did it. I did, I think here we have a, at most 20 points, 20 red points. You can do that. It will take, yeah, it, 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 take, it took less than one hour, I think. But for example, the other solution that, well, the solution that I obtained using the rich water equation and then applying the Chandrasekhar operator, which is the solid line, there I have, uh, for this case, I have uh, 10,000 10, points. So that's, mm -hmm. and to, to calculate that, uh, it took me, I think, uh, I don't remember exactly the time, but it was way uh, small the time compared to those 20 points that I have for, from the toolkit, for example. Okay. okay. Sure, the, the methods works, both works, but uh, there is a, time efficiency mm -hmm. has to be considered there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, a more general question, like um, when you do this green, green function methods, right? You, you are integrating along a, a specific um, um, trajectory, it could be a geodesics or not, but, uh, and you are in curved space time. So uh, it's, it's a genuine question, <laughs> like, I don't know. Can you decouple the, the, the contribution from uh, the, the trajectory? I, I, I guess that uh, for a different trajectory, you're gonna have a different green function. 
for the same background space time, right? So if you are in, in a Schwarzschild, like you, you mentioned in your communication paper, quantum communication paper, different observers are gonna have a different result, right? So the grid function depends not only on the background, but also on the trajectories you're, you, you're not analyzing. Okay. Yeah, right? um, uh, kind of, uh, there's a, a, a small note there because uh, I think that's more here okay so in this. exactly that that's my my, my question uh, can you can you separate these two things or it's so uh, mixed up that you cannot uh, kind of uh, everything is together and there's no no point of trying to separate the background and the trajectories or okay uh, so here that problem mostly will appear in the quasi local region where when we use uh, well in the quasi local region this is the green function right so when we want to calculate this u, which is a Van Breck determinant, and we use this transport equation, for example, right, this Van Breck determinant depends on two points, right? If you want to calculate this Van Breck determinant between say xA and xB, in order to solve this transport equation and calculate the Van Breck determinant for those specific points, you have to choose a geodesic that goes mm -hmm. Uh, between the, this, those two points and then evolve this equation and you will get the Wangler determinant there. But if we use this other approach, for example, an L mode decomposition, this G there, GL there, these modes are not uh, linked to any geodesic. So given two points, uh, well, here, uh, I, I, there is an, another note here. So this is the GLD, right? So as I said, this boundary determinant, determinant again, it can be solved via, via transport equations and we mm -hmm. will have that problem. But if we use the, the other small coordinate expansion, we don't have that, that problem. So we can, so the, the method will not depend on any geodesic or... So you could, so basically you, you could construct a green function that depends only on the background and not exactly. on the trajectories. Exactly. Okay. That only and happens that, for, for, for the Blanglet, Blanglet determinant. We are only using transport equation for the Blanglet determinant and the transport equations depends on the geodesic that you were uh, solved those. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, um, another question regarding this green function. So you mentioned that uh, you could separate the, the direct null um, contribution from the non-direct new contribution, right? In flat space time, <clears throat> sorry, in flat space time, uh, I, I guess the non-direct contribution goes to zero. Exactly. Correct? Okay, so my question, it's a, a, an open question maybe, but that could, could you like, could you, Decode, decode this non-direct null uh, contribution to learn from the background space-time, like it could, in, at least in principle, you could use this kind of uh, analysis to, to infer the, the background, what, like what kind of black holes you have. For instance, you imagine an experiment and uh, you analyze just the non-direct null contribution and could you say anything like uh, it is a charged black hole? It is has spinning, or at least in principle, could you do that? Maybe. Um, I guess you can obtain information about the black about the space time. No? Yeah, given a, a green function, like as you said, mm -hmm. uh, what you can obtain from those from that green function. Um, for example. Uh, well, I didn't talk much about the, that, but G, uh, the green function has um, a singular structure that it is, that it is strictly related mm -hmm. with with the space time. This singular structure will say will determine. Uh, yep. Well, yep. it is unique depending on your mm -hmm. on your space time, for example. Maybe I can show it the here. Yeah. Um, here. Like, uh, well, this is a log plot. And for the scalar case, okay, uh, the non-direct part goes to zero. That's not much information. Well, it will be, well, it is an inf uh, value, value information because as I said later on, I think uh, in the scalar case, um, uh, this 
V0 is zero and the non-gravitational case in the gravitational case, this V2 is different from zero. So if the non-direct part goes to zero, probably that green function will be uh, the green function for a scalar field, probably. The other thing is that there is a singularity in certain at certain positions of delta t here that it is related with no rays going around the black hole, uh, uh, in this case, around uh, the Schwarzschild space-time. So for Schwarzschild, I, uh, probably, yeah, I guess this singular, this singular, uh, this singularity is here will be strictly at certain values of delta t here and here and the, the other ones. And if you have, uh, for example, uh, a Kerr black hole, the singularity will be different because the space time is different. The position, I mean, I think mm -hmm. it will be different. So maybe you can infer which kind of black hole you're working with or from just by looking at the green function, no direct. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and uh, a more general uh, concern maybe because this is a qualification and um, so, I, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about um, how long you're going to take to finish your PhD. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, Absolutely. no, I, I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful work, like I said, it's, um, and you shouldn't hurry, you, you're doing a great job. I'm, I'm not criticizing anything like that. I'm just, could you, uh, I'm not an expert on this um, works also, so could you like uh, give a brief overview on uh, what, it's new on your work and what is uh, known in the literature or like uh, to, to clarify a little bit. I know that spin two, probably it's uh, something completely new that's, um, and, and, and you included more things in your presentation that in the, the, the manuscript you send us. So it's very nice this. So you, you have already, already new results, so. Right, um, so the thing the new things that we have uh, it's for example the characteristic initial data scheme um, mm -hmm. before it, there were there was a just a the, the scheme was from price and lost it was a, an h to the four order in the yeah h is the step size of the method and we managed to 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 obtain a higher order scheme that's a very new that's a new that's a new result and that's for the scalar part i think and for the gravitational um i'm not sure but uh, well i didn't plot it here like for example we already calculated the retarded the retarded green function for the uh for the full uh, Tchaikovsky equation, like mm -hmm. for the 4D that includes the angular and radial part, we have that plot, but I didn't include it here. We have it still to make some improvements. That's a, as well a very good, a very new result. And well, all the quantum communication part is uh, technically is very, very new. Like mm -hmm. no I one. Yeah, no one calculated this uh, quantum communication in these scenarios. Mm -hmm. And yeah, by calculating the CID that, uh, that we did, we were able to do that. Okay, and, and the how's new... going, yeah, and, uh, and how's going the, the self-force part? The, 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 yeah, so, so what, what is the, your, what is your plans for like, uh, mm -hmm. what? So, okay, um, I have already the expression for this, this gravitational green function that yeah. it is coming from Nakano Sasaki. Yeah. Um, after that, uh, the only remaining thing, I think it's to regularize that result. And that should be it. But once this is regularized, constructing the self is it's not very difficult. Uh, uh, I think, um, but as I mentioned, that process, uh, that regularization process, we, we tried different things, but they, at the end, they didn't work. Mm -hmm. But the common thing in those, um, in those attempts was that 
no matter when we will need this gravitational green function. So that's why we were, we're still calculating no matter if we know how to regularize it or not. And yeah, Barry also yeah already mentioned that suggested that there are people working on like constructing the gravitational green function in the time domain, not in the frequency domain as we are doing. Mm -hmm. If that's mm -hmm. possible, I think I have a couple, an idea how to regularize now this retarded green function or mm -hmm. this gravitational green function. Mm -hmm. uh, about the time, I am not sure how long that will take, but I would I would I would like that that it should it should take. I, Oh, okay, sure. I know it, it's hard to 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 yeah yeah to foresee this, but okay. No, I just wondering if uh, how long you're gonna, uh, how many more things you were planning to to include in your PhD. So uh, okay, no, it's fine. Like I said, I think it's a uh, very nice work, very solid, very interesting, and uh, uh, yeah, congratulations you too. It's a great great job. So yeah, I, I'll think I I'll stop here. I think. Uh, it has been a lot of questions already. So thanks, thanks, Davi, and thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Felipe, for the questions and the comments. Um, it is, it is. I have to say, it's painful not to be able to <laughs> to answer or participate. <laughs> but anyway, it's the nature of the of the process. So the next step is, I think, David and I will will leave the Zoom meeting and we'll leave the two members of the examining committee to, to write the report. Um, so I think maybe, Felipe, you can well, help Barry translate the forum and guide yeah. him through, through this. Yeah, sure. I, I, so I, but, uh, probably we should uh, stop recording right now, right? Oh, Beth, a gente deveria parar de gravar, né? Imagino eu agora. Sim, sim, é o, é o Mark e o Davi, se eles quiserem falar mais algumas coisas, alguma consideraçãozinha final antes de eu encerrar e eu parar de gravar, eles podem falar, aí só me avisar, eles saem da sala que eu, que eu encerro aqui, só para finalizar tá. lá no YouTube. Tá. Up to you two guys, like, <laughs> Mark and Davi, if you guys wanted to say well, something before I stop recording, like... <laughs> uh, I don't think I have anything else to say, so should I leave now? <laughs> oh, but uh, I think I think that uh, uh, probably uh, we have before finishing we have to say if it's approved or not, right? I think it thinks they use badge. Uh, uh, Barry, you and me we have to decide if it's approved in his qualification or not. Uh, my vote it's okay. yes, sure. There's plenty of work, so uh, you're it's up to you, Barry. Yes, I think I I agree very much. So yeah, okay, I'm quite happy. So. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you. David and I will leave now. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 See you guys. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. That's good. <laughs> Okay, so um, we just we need to, to fill a form. It's very simple. There is a, a couple of questions, like uh, mark questions and uh, space to, to write something. Uh, I can let me share the screen with you. Yeah. Let's see. Um, uh, second word is, I think it's this one. Do, do you see the form? Yes, I do, yeah. Uh, okay, so the, here is explaining what happened basically that um, uh, mm -hmm. we're going to, to um, argue with him. And here's the, the, the question. 